Okay, so we're talking about continuity. That's what we started last time talking about, and I want to say a little bit more about it this time. Continuity. I will just remind us of the definition. Welcome. Um, yeah, so we say f of x is continuous at some point. Um, what did I call it? C last time? Continuous at C. When lim x goes to C, f of x equals f of C. All right? Um, in other words, so that, that's, that's how I would write this definition. But if I wanted to go sort of all the way to first principles in terms of wh what exactly is, does the limit mean, it's this business with the epsilon. So it means for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than x minus c less than delta implies f of x minus f of c less than epsilon. All right. And we did at the end an example showing that something is continuous at a particular point. It's usually fairly easy if I, if I just tell you the function and tell you some point. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to do this whole example, but, um, you know, something like f of x equals x squared is continuous at three. How would I uh, how would I demonstrate that? I would say I want to show that lim x goes to three of x cubed equals uh, sorry x squared equals. Um, I have to put. Uh, f of c on the right side, uh, but my f in this case is x squared, so this would be c, which is 3, so this would be 3 squared, all right? This would say lim x goes to 3, x squared equals 9, right? This is what I would have to show. And then how do you show that? Well, you show that with the epsilons. This is actually fairly straightforward proof with the epsilon, so I don't think we need to do all of that, but I will just say prove this with the epsilon and deltas, All right? So that's how you would demonstrate a specific function is continuous at a specific point. You translate that statement into a limit, and then you just demonstrate that limit using the usual epsilon and delta technique. All right. Um, I want to talk about one sort of subtlety today about, oh, how about to show something is not continuous. So this is how you would show something is continuous at a particular point. That's fairly straightforward. To show something is not continuous, um, let me just say something like to show, say, f of x is not continuous at c, you must show, must show that that limit is not equal to f of c, right? The lim x goes to c, f of x does not equal f of c, right? This is what it would mean to be not continuous. And how do you show some limit does not equal something else? That actually is typically going to be easiest to do using sequences, and this is what we talked about last time. If you want to show that a limit does not exist or does not equal something else, you use sequences. So in order to show this, there are a few different ways that this can go. But um, I would say uh, probably best to find a sequence where xn approaches c, but f of xn does not approach f of c, right? We did several examples of that last time, so I don't think we need to go through that again. But this is how you would show that something is not continuous. It's usually best to use a sequences. You find a sequence that approaches C, but when you plug it into the function, the function values do not approach F of C. All right, this is showing something is not continuous. We did many examples of that last time. Um, I want to point out a bit of subtlety regarding discontinuities. So some subtlety here. Subtlety. 
Um, and this is actually one way in which I'm going to say something that is directly kind of the opposite of how you would say this in calculus. Usually all the stuff you know from calculus still applies in this class. It's just we're doing things on a more technical level. But this, in, in this case, the way that people talk about these things in calculus is not quite accurate from, a, from, a, from our point of view. So some subtlety about this. Um, in calculus class, we say f of x. If I'm talking, here's a specific example. f of x equals 1 over x. Does this function have any discontinuity points? And all the children say, yes, x equals 0. It is not continuous at x equals 0. I'm not going to say that. In, 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 uh, in our class, we are not going to say that. So in calculus, we say that this is discontinuous at x equals 0. All right. But actually, in, for our purposes, and uh, on a more technical level, it is more accurate to say that x equals 0 is not part of the domain. And so actually, you can't even talk about is it continuous or not at x equals 0. All right. Um, so and let me just say, we don't say this. because x equals 0 is outside the domain. of f of x, right? This function, 1 over x, 1 over x has domain, uh, you know, it's all real numbers except 0, right? That's the domain of this function as a set, is all real numbers except 0. And so because of that, actually, it is not even sensible to ask, is this function continuous or not at 0? Because 0 is not part of the domain. So we don't even. We don't ask, is f of x equal 1 over x continuous at 0? Right? The, that, uh, that question is not even a real question. Because why not? Like this, what this would mean, this means for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than x minus 0 less than delta implies f of x minus f of 0 less than epsilon. Right, that's what it would mean. I just plugged in the definition of con continuous. But actually, there's, a, there's something wrong with this. What, can anyone see what's, what's wrong with that? I'm saying like it doesn't even make sense to say that stuff in red. Not even that it's false. It just you can't say it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it includes f of 0 as part of what I wrote there in red. But there, there is no such thing as f of 0. So actually, that whole thing that I wrote in red is meaningless. It, you can't even, uh, like it's, as they say, so wrong it's not even false. Like you can't, you can't say is this true or not because it's not even meaningful because of that little f of 0 here. So in this case, there is no f of 0. So this doesn't this doesn't make sense the whole question about is it continuous or not at zero that's that's not a well formed question all right so for our purposes at least it is not correct to say it's uh, f of x is not continuous at zero instead i would just say zero is not part of the domain and leave it at that all right now you could say in the back of your mind you say oh, yeah yeah that means it's not continuous i mean it can't possibly be continuous and something that's not in the domain anyway. All right, so we don't ask, is it continuous at zero? Um, we would say, we'll just say, in a situation like this, zero is outside the domain. So don't even ask me about if it's, if it's continuous or not at zero. It, you can't even talk about that. Zero is outside the domain. All right? Of course, like in a calculus class, it still means something when they say it's discontinuous at zero. I think what, what is meant, if you want to give it a real technical footing, is that zero is outside of the domain, first of all. And also, no matter if you try to insert a value at zero, it's going to be discontinuous no matter where you, where you stick that extra value at zero. Uh, there is no way to plug that value in. 
in a way which makes it continuous. Um, and so kind of somewhat informally we say in a calculus class that that's a discontinuity point, but it is not continuous. All right, um, for example, we could consider, if you really wanted to talk about this, we could consider something like f of x equals something like this, one over x, if x is not zero, and I just have to insert another value just to make it so that zero is part of the domain. I could put in, say, uh, two here, if x equals zero. So the graph of this would look something like, well, it looks like one over x, except it has this other value just stuck in there. Why did I put it up at two? I don't know. I just put it somewhere, all right? Do you prefer it to be at the origin? Because of symmetry or something? I don't know. You can fill in the value however you like, though. Uh, but anyway, we can consider that. And this is not continuous at zero. So this we could actually try to demonstrate. Can we? Uh, let's, let's try it out, actually. Can we demonstrate this is not continuous at zero? Zero really is part of the domain, so we should be able to, uh, to demonstrate that. All right. How would I demonstrate that? I would like to translate this into a, see, a statement about limits and then demonstrate the thing about limits. Uh, anyone want to try that? How would I write this uh, um, in terms of limits? I'll say I want to basically turn it into something, something like this, right? But I'm saying it's not continuous at zero. Yeah. The limit as x approaches zero of f of x does not equal f of zero. Yeah, great. Uh-huh. Um, and in fact, we could simplify like you can actually say what is f of zero? It is two, according to this weird definition that I made. All right. So I'll say IE again. Lim x goes to zero, f of x is not equal to two, right? And as I said before, the typical way you would do this is using sequences. So I want to think of a sequence. So I want to show um, a sequence xn which approaches zero, but f of xn, the sequence, does not approach two. All right. This is what it takes to demonstrate that that limit does not equal two. Anybody have an idea? A sequence xn which approaches zero. You, you know what I'm thinking? Do you smell what the rock is cooking, as they used to say? Yeah. One over, One over n is exactly what I'm thinking. Um, yeah. You don't have to. There's no reason to get fancy in this example. Um, if we want a sequence xn goes to zero, so let's try xn equal 1 over n. Even if it doesn't work, usually if you try this out, something will happen and maybe that'll tell you how you should tweak it. But actually, in this case, you don't, you don't need to change it at all. So try xn equal 1 over n. Then, what about, uh, so can I just say xn does approach 0, right? And what about when I plug it in, f of xn? This would be f of 1 over n. And what is that? I go up to the definition of my function f of 1 over n. Now, f has this weird definition in two pieces. Sorry, i got to scroll. f of 1 over n. It has this weird definition in two pieces, which is a pain to plug into. But actually, uh, the thing that I'm plugging in is 1 over n. And 1 over n is never 0. So actually, it's always going to use the first piece. I never have to worry about the second piece, because what I'm plugging in is not 0. It's 1 over n. And so when I plug in, I can use the first piece, and I get I get 1 over x, but I'm plugging x equals 1 over n, right? So this is really 1 over 1 over n, which is, of course, n. All right, so we plugged 1 over n in for x in the function 1 over x. So it's 1 over 1 over n, which is n. And what do you say about this sequence? Does it converge to 2? No, it diverges, right? F of x, uh, uh, this sequence is just n, so it's unbounded, which means it doesn't converge to anything. 
So it does, in particular, it does not converge to 2. So f of xn equals n is unbounded, so it doesn't converge. So it diverges. So what's important is f of xn does not converge to 2. which is what I wanted to show, right? Uh, and this also, uh, I think it's not so hard to see that really there was nothing special about the number two here. If this two instead, you know, I'm, I'm, I invented this number two up here. I, I just called it a two. Why did I use two rather than any other number? It doesn't matter, I just picked it sort of at random. Um, but the two, the proof never involved the two, right? This had nothing to do with the two. So for exactly the same reason, this thing would be discontinuous no matter where you stuck the extra point. It's always going to be discontinuous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, it's because this function, zero is part of the domain. Because I told you that the value, when it's zero, the value is two. Whereas up here, ordinary one over x has no, no extra point, and so zero is not, has no value. Yeah, thanks. All right, excellent. So this all was just a little kind of technicality, subtlety about how you discuss points where it's not continuous versus points where it's just not part of the domain at all. A similar example would be, um, sine of 1 over x. This was a weird function that we, I, I showed the graph of last time. It looks kind of like this. It looks like sine, but like ev ever accelerating um, waves as you approach the origin. This thing also is um, here, x equals 0 is outside the domain. All right, so I don't even talk about is this function continuous or not at the origin. The answer is, well, the, the x equals zero is not part of the domain, so you can't really discuss if it's continuous or not. If you decide arbitrarily to plug in a single value somewhere in the middle, then it won't be continuous uh, anymore, but that's a separate question. This function by itself is not continuous at zero because zero is outside the domain. All right, here's an interesting example before we move on to something a little bit different. How about x sine of one over x, if x is not zero, and zero if x is zero. This is another one of my favorite functions. Um, what it looks like if you think about the graph. So first of all, f of zero equals zero. That's like the special, the <coughs> special single point that, I, that the second line gives you. The more interesting thing to look at is the first line. x times sine of one over x. It looks like this one again, this thing, which is just sine of one over x, but this whole thing is multiplied by x, all right? What that means is this thing, uh, it's just the sign of something, so its values oscillate between one and minus one forever, right? What this one is, it's the same thing, only its values here oscillate between x and minus x, right? Because the sign part just goes from minus one to one, and the x part is just x. So it's always just x times something, and that, that other something is oscillating between one and minus one and oscillating increasingly rapidly as you reach the origin. What this ends up, I don't know if you can uh, imagine what that's gonna look like. What it ends up looking like is, if I think of oscillations between x and minus x. Um, x is here, right? I'm using my dotted line drawer, how do you like that? And then minus x is like here. So what this thing does is it is oscillations between those two values and increasingly fast oscillations as you approach the origin. So it looks something like this, like that. It's pretty cute if you graph this on your calculator. Amaze your friends. It looks like that, all right? 
x times 1 over x. And I stuck the special value of 0 right in the middle because, to, you know, as written, you're not allowed to plug 0 into this formula for x. But, uh, you know, if you're look at, looking at the picture, it seems to make sense to stick uh, the origin as it seems to be like a legal <laughs> point in the middle there. So might as well fill it in. All right. This one, I would ask you, is it continuous or not at the origin? Um, the question is, as the x values get close to 0, do the y values actually get close to the value at the origin, which is 0? I, I would say they do. When the x is nearby here, the y values are all near the origin. So this, actually, can we, can we try and prove this? This is continuous at x equals 0. All right, let's see if we can do this with the epsilons and the deltas, and then we'll move on to something uh, a little different. All right, so let's try and prove this with the epsilons and the deltas. So I want to show, maybe I'll just write it first of all as with limbs. I want to show lim x goes to 0, f of x equals f of 0, but f of 0 is 0, right? I plug, that's part of the definition, that f of 0 equals 0. You can see at the very top. So what I want to show is lim x goes to 0 of f of x equals 0. And if I were writing this using the epsilons, let's translate this into the epsilons, i.e. for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than x minus 0 less than delta implies f of x minus f of 0, which is 0, less than epsilon. All right. Um, we could simplify, you don't have to write all those minus zeros, right? Really, this just means zero less than absolute value x less than delta implies absolute value f of x less than epsilon, all right? And I'm going to try as much as possible to do this one the way that we usually do these proofs. Um, although it's weird because we have this weird definition of f in, in two pieces, but hopefully everything will work out fine. Let's, uh, let's just try. I'll switch to my red pen. I start like that, right? And I want to do less than or equals. We're going to try to simplify as much as we can. f of x is, well, we immediately have this problem that Sorry to, uh, sorry to scroll away. f of x is that weird function in two pieces, right? Um, we get a little bit lucky, and this is, I believe, the first time ever this has really mattered in one of these proofs. We uh, are allowed to assume, while we're doing the simplifying, that x is greater than 0 and less than delta. This never mattered before in any of the other examples we did, but it's very helpful in this example. We are assuming that the absolute value of x is greater than 0, which means when I plug into f of x, I can just use the first piece and I don't have to worry about the second piece because I'm assuming the absolute value of x is greater than 0. So this, I can just say, is equal to absolute value x sine x, uh, sine 1 over x. All right. I will just say parenthetically since 0 less than absolute value x. We've never actually made use of that part of the definition, but it matters in this case. All right. And now I have a nice, I suppose, nice looking formula. Nice enough, at least. Anyone want to suggest uh, simplifications you can do here? There's not a whole lot you can do, but I'm thinking of one thing. Yeah? Yeah, split up the absolute value. I have absolute value x times sine 1 over x, so make it absolute value x times absolute value sine 1 over x. You can do that. Absolute value x times absolute value sine 1 over x. Okay. Now what? Now, uh, Kevin's not here. He can't tell me some ridiculous trick he knows about sine of 1 over x. Actually, th there's no ridiculous trick at least that I'm aware of, of sine of 1 over x. But um, we can do something that's kind of convenient here. Sine of 1 over x, everybody knows, in absolute value, I'm going to use a less than or equal. Any ideas? Is sine of 1 over x less than or equal to something or other? Less than. 
One. Yeah, it's the sine of something. So its, it's absolute value is between minus one and one. So I'm going to just, I mean, do this basically, right? One. So this is uh, absolute value x, right? And actually this, I don't know if you feel like this has gone, have we gone too far by just throwing away the interesting part of the function? Actually, it's not because um, this x, absolute value x, is really what we wanted to solve for eventually anyway, right? So what I, what I would typically say at this point is we need uh, absolute value x to be less than epsilon. And so we choose delta, really we just choose delta to be equal epsilon and then everything should work out, right? Because we already have x uh, being less than delta. So how uh, I would, continuing the real proof here, I say let uh, delta equal epsilon. You don't need any like minimum of whatever, whatever. It's just, just choosing delta to be epsilon is gonna do it for us, all right? Then I'll just write out the, uh, the end here. Zero less than x less than delta implies uh, absolute value f of x, first of all. This equals absolute value x sine one over x, which is less than or equal to absolute value x, which is less than delta, which is equal to epsilon. So f of x is less than epsilon as desired. All right. A little strange, but it, I mean, when you write the proof, actually, it, it turns out to be quite easy. Not, not a lot going on here. It's just because sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to 1. Um, no real fancy tricks involved. All right. Any thoughts about that? So this is, this is, a, this is a great function. I like, the, uh, I like the picture, at least. All right. Great, I thought maybe this would be a nice time. I got an old, uh, an old comprehensive exam question you wanna try? Eh? Yeah, everybody's thinking about the comprehensive exam. I am, at least, because I know I'm, I'm in charge of it now. Um, this is an old, uh, an old comprehensive exam question. Usually I try to tell you like, if, is this an easy one or a hard one? I would say, this is one of those where if you know the appropriate trick, it's easy, but um, I would say this is kind of an obscure one. So uh, that's what I'll call it, obscure. Easy if you know how to do it, although uh, it's not, this is not the kind of thing I would spend all night studying this particular thing because it's very specific. Although, um, yeah. Uh, I'm not saying this won't be on the comp next time around, huh? Mm -hmm. I gotta start playing all kinds of mind games because you know I'm gonna be writing the real analysis section of the comprehensive exam. So every little thing that I say could be a hint. It will not be a hint. I'm, I have no idea what questions will be on it yet. I will just. Yeah. Yeah, it's just our own, uh, our own thing. Yeah. Mm hmm. No. <laughs> no, no, I said you take the year off next year. Yeah. <laughs> Skip it, yeah. It's very common at graduate schools, but not very common at uh, undergraduate uh, programs. Yeah. If you fail, basically nothing happens. Um, the, uh, so the, the consequences are um, on your transcript, it says that there was a comprehensive exam and it says whether you passed or failed. You can fail and you will still graduate and like nothing else will happen to you, but on your transcript for, for eternity it will say comprehensive exam <laughs> failed. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a little disappointing, you know, but it, I, the, the real life consequences are minimal, but uh, if anybody ever looks at your transcript in a job interview or something, they will say, what does that mean? And you say, oh, means I failed. You, uh, so the, there, the rule is, in order to graduate, you must take the exam. Uh, you don't have to pass it. And one time in the, in the, in the deep past, 
some some uh, some gang of uh, math major bros decided to show up to the exam. They wrote their names on the paper and handed in blank paper because they were like out of protest. Um, and the rule says you have to take the exam, not that you have to pass it. So after that, we changed the rule to say you must make a good faith effort on the, on the exam. So you have to take it and you have to try. Or at least you have to convince us that you tried. Um, yeah, so if you do not make a good faith effort, then we can prevent you from graduating. But uh, if you just try and fail, that's okay. Uh, and then if you do really well, you can, so the, your transcript will either say failed or passed or passed with distinction, which also doesn't really matter, but you can, <laughs> you can, you can feel good about it. <laughs> Usually it's like, um, if there's like 20 people take the test, maybe uh, one or two will pass with distinction. So it's, it's, it's hard to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually we have like zero to two fail and say one or two pass with distinction. There have been years when nobody passed with distinction, but uh, yeah. All right, anyway, you wanna try an old obscure comp question. Um, so it says, here's what it said, prove from the definition, that means like use the epsilons, that if F and G are continuous at A, on this test, they use the letter A. Then F plus G is continuous at A. All right, this is what you have to prove. So using from the definition means use the epsilons. Don't just say something about limb, write limb every time, and then use some rule about limb of F plus limb of G equals limb of F plus G. That is true and that, that would be correct, but it says proof from the definition, so they, they don't want you to do it that way. Um, F plus G is continuous. So I would begin this as, all right, here's my proof. I would start by saying what I want to show is that F plus G is continuous at A. So let's write out that in terms of the epsilons. I would say let epsilon greater than zero be given. And then we'll find delta. This is how I would always start one of these proofs, such that zero less than x minus a less than delta, right? That's where continuous at c, I would say x minus c here, it's continuous at a, implies, what do you think over here? I have to show f plus g is continuous. So anyone wanna say what should I write over here? This is where I would ordinarily write f of x minus f of c. So what should it be? Yeah. f of x plus f of g minus f of x plus g of x, I think is what you meant. Yeah, yeah. That's f plus g, but I plug the x in, minus, and then what? Yeah, the same stuff with a's, right? So it. Usually I would write f of x minus f of c. So it's, it's that stuff with the x and then minus that same stuff with the a. Make sure you remember your parentheses here, like so, less than epsilon. All right. So this is what we need to show. OK. You know, I would suggest when you're doing problems like this, try not to get intimidated by all of this. Just try and do what you would usually do, which is um, in red here, you don't have to use red, but I'm going to write this stuff and try to simplify it somehow. So let's try that. F of x plus g of x minus, now the first natural thing would be to distribute the minus sign. I'm gonna try to do as many steps as possible without really having to have any, any kind of original idea. All right, anybody got an idea for uh, something we could do with that? Yeah? 
Yeah, I like that. I feel like it should be helpful if we put the F's together and the G's together. Because after all, we have assumed F and G individually are continuous. So it's better to separate things out in terms of the F's and the G's. So I'm going to go F of X uh, minus F of A and then plus G of X minus G of A. Right? Okay. I would say proceeding purely on autopilot, this may be where you s would have to stop and start to think. Although if you write down this much, you'll, you're already gonna get some partial credit if I was grading this question. Uh, anybody have an idea from here now? Um, I don't know if anybody was thinking this, but I might feel a little bit better if it was this absolute value plus this absolute value rather than the absolute value of the whole thing. Can I, is that the same? Can I just say equals? Yeah, it's not the same, but you can use the triangle inequality. Remember the triangle inequality says like A plus B absolute value is less than or equal to absolute value A plus absolute value B. So it's not an equal, it's a less than or equal, but that's fine. In, the, in a proof like this, I'm okay using less than or equals. So that's great. So I'm gonna go less than or equal to F of X minus F of A absolute value plus absolute value of G of X minus G of A. All right. That one, that last thing we did, I would say maybe this is like half autopilot. I hope that you would still naturally want to do that, even if, even before you have any kind of real idea about anything. Although now is the time at which you have to really look at this and have some kind of a idea. And my idea would be, if x is close to a, what can I say about this and what can I say about this? Well, since f and g are both continuous, that means each of these things should be less than epsilon, or it should be really small. In fact, this is the classical scenario where you use what I call the epsilon over two trick. I make this, each of these things, less than epsilon over two, right? And so that they will add together and make epsilon. We did this uh, a few times using sequences. So the way that I would write this is something like, choose delta so small that zero less than x minus a less than delta implies this one, f of x minus f of a less than epsilon over two, and also the other one, less than epsilon over two, right? This is the old epsilon over two trick. This, we did basically the same thing with sequences, although it was, you know, a few weeks ago, so I don't know if you remember this trick, but, uh, I can choose the delta to be small enough so that both of those things are less than epsilon over two. All right, and then, then everything just, I will just restate this stuff and observe that it all adds up to epsilon. So then absolute value f of x plus g of x minus f of a minus g of a uh, is less than or equal to, I'll just skip some of the intermediate steps epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is epsilon, all right? Plus one bonus point for writing shoon. You don't get bonus points for that on the comp, but. All right. I am, as the writer of this section, I am also the grader of this section, uh, but it's really me and um, Professor Demers who will write and grade this section. He will likely be entertained if you all write shoon entertained and confused. All right, any, uh, any thoughts about this? I don't think that this is, uh, you know, I, I'm friends with Professor Demers, but it's a personal thing about me that I don't think he knows that I write tune at the end of my proofs. All right, I'm not ashamed of it. Okay, so this, um, this, this was a comp question. I, I think uh, if you, so what I said about this is obscure but not really hard. If you are, for some reason, are used to doing this, which, which is a useful trick to do in, in several different uh, settings. If you remember how to do this, then there really are no surprises in this whole proof. Everything just kind of goes the way that you would want it to go. Although, um, from a, from a test writing point of view, I'm always wondering, you know, is this question too hard or not? I think, if anything, this question might be too hard just because people might, might not remember how to do that. But if you, if you do know what you're doing, then this is, I would say, not hard at all. 
All right, great. Um, this actually is a proof of part of this theorem that I want to write here about continuity. So this, what we just proved is if f and g are continuous, then f plus g is also continuous. And so there's actually a, a, a sort of theorem in four parts. This is one of the parts. There's also one that it, it also says that when I multiply them, it's continuous and so on. So can I write that down? All the proofs are similar. I don't want to go through the proofs of this because we've done these things already. But um, I'm going to say if f and g are continuous, I'm going to say at c, just because I usually say at c, then uh, number one, k f of x is continuous at c for any constant. Also, number two, f of x plus g of x is continuous. This is the one we just proved. It's continuous at c. Also, uh, multiplication, f of x times g of x is continuous at c. Notice I'm only talking about one point at a time here, all right? And these are all the same at the same point. And then finally, the last one is a quotient, right? So f of x divided by g of x is continuous at c um, as long as g of c is not 0, all right? So the takeaway is if you have two continuous functions, you can basically combine them in any way you want algebraically, and the result will still be continuous. The only thing in terms of algebraic combinations, that is adding and multiplying and dividing, the only thing you need to worry about is making zeros in the denominator. So um, standard example of this is like 1 over x. 1 over x is a fraction of 1, which is continuous, and x, which is continuous. And so 1 over x is also always continuous as long as the bottom is not zero. So one over x is continuous um, for all real numbers as long as the bottom is not zero. Now we don't, because of what I said before, we don't exactly say one over x is discontinuous at x equals zero, we just say x equals zero is not part of the domain. But all right, this is a theorem. So a nice little uh, easy corollary is that any polynomial is continuous, right? That's because any polynomial is obtained by just multiplying x times a constant, or x times x gives you x squared, x times x times x gives you x cubed. So any polynomial can be built in, in, in stages by multiplying just constants and x. And since those are continuous, it means any polynomial is continuous, continuous at any C and R, right? For any real number, it is always continuous. And I'm going to say, sort of for the same reasons, polynomials you construct only by adding and multiplying. If you additionally want to divide, that's also fine. Usually, it's going to be continuous. So I'll say any uh, ratio of polynomials, that's called a rational function. But any polynomials type stuff which also involves denominators or dividing by things. Any ratio of polynomials is continuous. I'm just going to say at all points in its domain. I.e. whenever the denominator is not zero. But any ratio of polynomials is continuous at I said all, all. I meant to say at all. I'll change it to at with two t's. At all points in its domain. All right? That is to say, continuous whenever the denominator is zero. Uh, I have one more example that I wanted to do, which is going to take more than five minutes. Maybe I'll just uh, give you a little, a little next time. Um, remember, one of my favorite functions that we've talked about so far is uh, Tomei's function. 
it says it was this one, 1 over n if x equals m over n in q and 0 otherwise. Uh, if I should say 0 if x is irrational. Right, and this is this was that one which the graph is hard to actually draw the graph, but it looks something like this. It has these like individual points. What am I doing here? It was actually like this. Whatever, something like that, right? And then all of the irrational values go to zero. All the rationals go to some other values. Uh, like that. It looks like some kind of weird tree. I want to demonstrate when is this continuous and when is it not continuous using the epsilons. All right. This, of course, is not a polynomial at all. It's a crazy thing with a very weird formula. But um, this one is, come on now, is not continuous <coughs> at any C in Q. The Q points are when you get these like loner isolated points up here and it's, n it's definitely not continuous there because like there's no curve that goes through there. This is just a point sitting all by itself in space. That's a discontinuity point. But it is continuous at all the irrationals. That's the more interesting fact is that actually the function is continuous on, the, on a dense part of the domain but it has discontinu discontinuities everywhere. Very strange. But uh, that's what I want to show next time. Not continuous at any rational, but um, continuous. Continuous for all C not in Q. All right. That's going to take more than three minutes. So I will leave you with that. Thank you for your attention. Hope you have a good weekend.